Let's bring in David Benson, founder and CIO of the Benson Group, joining us from New York. Great to see you. Thanks so much for your time today. Well, let's just get you to weigh in here, David. I mean, all, overall, when it comes to market direction, we are at this stage now where everyone is wondering what happens next for the markets. It does seem in the last few days we've been kind of in this cautionary trade. Give us your assessment. Well, I think that we've been there for a couple of months now, and we've had little periods where we moved higher, been a couple minor adjustments, primarily in the technology side. But my view has been for some time that valuations are quite rich with those things that performed best last year, the FANG group, the big tech, but a lot of the smaller technology names as well that I'm not sure everyone is noticing that they are indeed rolling over. Even mm. with a recent little uh, comeback, they still have stayed really in a downward trend. I think it mostly has to do with valuation. There is a lot of froth, a lot of speculative aspects. But then you look to some of the healthier sides of the market, strong balance sheet companies that are highly cash flow generative. They weren't loved by investors last year they're much more loved this year. Yeah, some of those companies that are more loved this year include the financials, David, but uh, we just heard a little snippet there of the testimony on Capitol Hill, or the exchange, I should say, between Jamie Dimon. And it makes me wonder, I mean, is the regulatory risk hanging over these companies accurately priced in, and perhaps not even from a pure regulatory standpoint? I mean, if we just talk about some of the tax risks as well on the cards. Well, let's start with the regulatory side because I think mm. that the regulatory abuse that the sector has taken has been going on for 10 years. And ironically, from the clip you showed, it's with some of the very same people. And um, JP Morgan's corporate profits over the last 10 years are $250 billion. We bought the stock after the financial crisis in the 20s. It's currently in the 160s. So the regulatory issues that they've tried to throw at a JP Morgan have clearly not been able to hold down their earnings power and their highly competent management team. Now, I think that when you look to the tax side, it's something that would apply to the entire market. So there's both the uncertainty as to what they're going to be able to do politically. I'm very skeptical that the administration has either the votes in the Senate or the House to be able to pass some of the more egregious tax things they might want to do. But I also believe that whatever happens tax-wise is going to happen across the board. It can be negative, but it's equally negative across all sectors and asset classes. Uh, David, good morning. Uh, Tanvi joining in this conversation. Would you continue to be bullish on banks if there was a regulatory overhang for these entities? Um, I would only be selectively bullish. So we're bottom-up investors, and we think some companies have the pricing power, have the management, have the return on equity. That's really what has separated J.P. Morgan from their inferior peers at Wells Fargo, City group and Bank of America is a far more impressive return on equity. So we would be um, very bullish on those companies that have been able to execute and that still have a franchise that has earnings power, not reliant only on net interest margin. The yield curve has widened a bit this year, but we don't want that to be the only thesis for owning a bank stock. We want to have strong investment banking and other uh, elements as well. But uh, JP would be the standout for us. Okay. Uh, where are we in the energy cycle, David, according to you? Because you're bullish on that space as well. And we've seen the energy index again about 34, maybe 35 percent year to date. Uh, you are also advocating the USCF a Midstream Energy Income Fund ETF. So I want to get your thoughts here. Yeah, when we talk about being advocates for the energy sector, we're primarily focused on the midstream space. Now, we really do believe Chevron and Exxon have been an incredible incredible recovery story. They maintained their dividend through the difficulties of last year. We are not able to go buy some of the lower quality producers and drillers just from a risk reward standpoint. Their leverage rates are a little too high for us. So on the upstream side, we think Chevron and Exxon are really high quality integrateds with great dividends. But as you mentioned with this UMI, it's an actively managed ETF that's only focused on the pipelines. And the, it's up, the, the whole space is up about 40% year to date, but still with really high yield spreads, indicating plenty of room to go, very high cash flows. 
And the whole space has really improved its financial discipline, lower CapEx, lower debt ratios. And so we think that those types of names make a lot of sense here. If there's one thing we've learned recently, it's that we need more oil and gas pipelines. David, that's for sure. But why do you think, I mean, is that the reason why investors are shrugging off what is a great deal of backlash at these shareholder meetings around climate change? I mean, we heard a lot of concerns going into this year that these stocks were vulnerable because of the climate change push in part. So why have the shares not been responding to that? Well, because the the shares know what we all know as investors, that ultimately the performance of these stocks will come down to their earnings and not a lot of noise that a disproportionate amount of people may make. The fact of the matter is that Exxon and Chevron are going to have to be leaders in a lot of these things that people are looking for, or those things are not going to happen. And very few companies have put more money into advocating for a carbon tax than Exxon. Well, it's sort of ironic there. But I think that The reality is the space had bottomed last year. It's almost impossible to think about both supply and demand conditions being worse than they were in a global pandemic shutdown. Now you have incredibly resurgent demand and the leaders in supply generation coming back to meet it. I think that's why the shares are responding. These are cash generating machines when the world is up and running. Right. And if the business still seems viable, then why not? Uh, David, thank you very much uh, for joining us and giving us your take on the markets.